do you change? You know, depending upon the setting, the people that are around you, do you like rise up, you know, with the floatsome and jetsam? You know, floatsam is the stuff that floats on the water, and jetsam is can't remember. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> but seriously, I was thinking about that today. You know, I have toast and peanut butter, sort of. My lifestyle pretty much has always been the same when I have a certain amount of money. I still tend to always be very frugal about it, but because I'm always looking for deals and not cheaper ways to do things, but I pretty much stick to simple things. So whether I prosper or whether I am brought to poverty, kind of still live the same way. Today, in my poverty, I found that mold had grown on my bread. You know, bread mold. So I cut off, you know, the piece and toasted it. I'm eating it. You know, and there's more mold, I'm going to cut off the rest of it and eat it. Because today, pretty much need to eat it or it's all going to turn to mold. I don't like to waste it. But, you know, it got me thinking. I was talking to the Lord about it. I know a lot of people that go to designer coffee shops or whole earth food stores and spend a lot of money on healthy living. You know, I'm glad we can be consumed with and participate in taking care of the fleshy body. But are we as consumed about taking care of our spiritual body? Because you see, I don't really care about this one I'm living in. I'm trading it in. I keep it going, you know, so much so that, you know, a lot of times I have to trust in the spiritual body being stronger than my fleshy body because believe me or not, this fleshy body really should have died a long time ago. But in my life, one of the things that I enjoy is that aspect that irregardless of whether I prosper or am in poverty, I've never really been into this idea of spending a lot of money on health. You know, I mean, I can see where people take vitamins, and now that I'm older, I, I take vitamins. Matter of fact, when I had the money, I went to Costco and bought this little mega vitamin thing, you know, and took them in. For a while, I kind of enjoyed it, and then I noticed I was getting irritable. So I quit taking them. Whatever was in them was probably not working. But as I changed my diet, I still wanted to take vitamins. I took them less and kind of watered and diluted them and, you know, kind of took different kinds. A friend of mine gave me some vitamins, you know, that they had that they didn't want. They were thrown away, so I took them. And now I'm taking vitamins again. The Lord provided. But I've never been one of those people that goes out to find 60 or 70 different kinds of vitamins, you know, that Dr. Oz recommends or anybody else. And spend all this money on cleaning up my act, you know, like act, acne or wrinkles or, you know, maybe gray hair. Or, you know, even for me, my acromial clavicular separation. You know, when this happened in Israel, I was riding a bicycle and I hit a brick, you know, and went flying over the handlebars. And I had jerked my arm up so hard to protect my head because I was hitting the streets of Jerusalem hard out in Talpio Talpio that uh, phew, I went flying and I guess they jerked it so hard that I yanked the, the muscle out and I thought I was really hurt bad and it hurt you know pretty pretty serious and I walked the bike back to you know the warehouse where the ministry was at and I remember going to the doctor in Jerusalem that was interesting 
He told me that since I was a, an American, that it would cost me $10,000 to get this stitched back in and left there. But he said, really, you know, it's not going to hurt you if you just left it. So, needless to say, it looks kind of bony sticking up, but if I lift my shoulder, you can't see it. <laughs> so I've never really been one to spend lots of money on my health. Although lots of money has been spent on my health at <laughs> different times in order to keep me alive because I've been disabled at different times. But one of the things that the Lord brought to my mind was when the children of Israel went into the land, you know, the goodly land that God said he would promise to them, he warned them. He said, look, you're going to go into a land full of milk and honey. Don't drink the milk and don't eat the honey. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, he said, you'll be blessed. But this is what I want you to do. I don't want all your money. I don't want most of your money. I just want a little bit. When you increase, I want a little bit. I want you to remember who it is that caused you to be blessed. And that's really why God did that with the children of Israel because he knew human nature. Human nature is to take advantage of something and forget where the advantage came from. In America, evangelical Christianity did the same thing. At one point in time, back when the economy was doing its thing, I remember Christians buying massive amounts of property and flipping properties. You know, it was this whole joke about, oh, let's flip a property and make a bundle of bucks. You know, and a lot of people try to tell me why America went into its tailspin, you know, and the economy went south or, so to speak, north or whichever way it went. And also, at the same time, Christian influence seemed to be waning and not in control anymore. For me, having lived through that, oh, I know what it was, and I know where God said it came from. And to be perfectly blunt, it's really you and I. You know, we, we kind of got carried away in our prosperity and thought, hey, everything's hunky dory, man. We can just we can do our, our money this and our money that and get into this and get into that and we spend our money on Harleys and ministries and doing things we never could have done before. And we forsook the ways of the Lord. We took our eyes off of the focus and the attention of our spirits of where it should have been. And I can look back at Christianity, evangelicalism, and see just in Googling it on the news the things that Christians were involved in, the things that Christians were doing, the things that the mega ministries were directing themselves towards. And it wasn't God. But it was an awful lot of prosperity going on at the time. So the Lord warned the children of Israel to if you forsake the land, or if you forsake the Lord and don't do what I said, then I will remove these blessings from you, and they'll gradually fade away. And that's kind of what happened to America. You know, is everyone in America really is rich. I mean, if you compared it to any other country in the world, you know, you have a hard time. I mean, maybe Abu Dhabi, but even then, you find people that are extremely wealthy and super poor. But the point is this. As a nation, this is the wealthiest nation, even the poorest of poor, which right now I qualify for one of those. <laughs> I'm pretty poor. And me and my wife, you know, we're, we're going to have to do something pretty soon. <laughs> but we're not really worried about it. But you see, when it comes to prosperity, really, what most Americans are used to, other countries in the world would have called the wealthy get that, but not the normal everyday person. What your comfort zone is really is elevated a lot higher standard than what God intended it to be. You see, Jesus said it this way, how hard it is for a wealthy man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a wealthy man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And in a lot of ways, 
he's saying that to America because I don't know right now too many people because you know we and I know pastors are going to jump my case on this some of them you know they're not too many if the Lord said today take now thy son thine only son Isaac you know and go sacrifice him. they're not going to do it I already know that that's that's just unwritten law uh uh no way Lord I, I'm past that I got grace we don't do that nowadays really <laughs> okay or better yet Take up your cross, deny yourself, follow me. Well, no, ever since Jesus died, you know, we got the Holy Spirit. We don't do that no more. You see, I always find that interesting. Are you sure? Because I wonder, when I read the letters to seven churches, especially about your first love, where and how are we living our lives today? Are we living them in accordance to God's Word and what He told us to do? Because the law is still in effect in a lot of ways. It doesn't have the penalty of sin upon us, of death, you know, and, and you know, wiping us out. But the consequences of sin directly involving reaping what you sow still apply. You don't get away with, you know, not getting back what you put into really doing wrong. So if you, you know, kind of screw up, guess what? It does come back. You will pay the penalty of some type. Because God's not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that also shall he reap. But I find if you would humble yourself and then ask for mercy, God usually comes through and is merciful. Even though you deserve what you got, even though you really had the penalty of it come at you, then God can forgive you for it once it's been determined you're guilty and you know it and you admit it. And that's kind of where Christians aren't very good at it right now. You know, I would say in these latter days, especially with the Lord coming back soon, we need to be more honest about who we are, how we are, and what we are. Because we're really just a bunch of poor Christians saved by grace, living in a land that's prosperous. And the reality is we've got more than we really know what to do with. There's always something that can be done. People like to say, well, you know, there's 10% unemployment or even 12% or some ridiculous number and I think but 12% is better than 50% do you get it? in other countries there are places where people don't have a job at all because there are no jobs at all most people today if they wanted to could find some kind of work to do they could make their way somehow they would be provided for in some way So really the prosperous nation that we are we need to be careful with the Lord our God who has shed his grace upon each and every one of us allowing us to be living in this land that we are now currently a part of because should God curse the land and say things dry up <clears throat> you know your financial source or your your monetary source and, you know, that would make you change your job. And you change it, obviously. But what if it was worse than that? What if it got worse? Like the children of Israel when God said, I'm putting you into sub servitude for 400 years. That's twice as long as America's been around. What would that be like <clears throat> for evangelical Christians, much less any Christian that you know of? How many people right now that you know that are walking with the Lord would say, Praise the Lord, I'm going into servitude for 400 years. The nation hasn't been around that long, and already Christians are whining and complaining about not being in charge. You see, comfort zones are interesting things. We have to draw our strength from and our comfort from the Lord because the circumstances of our life are always going to keep changing. One day, you might wake up and find your crust of bread has mold on it. And you may have to tear it off <clears throat> or cut it off and set it aside and eat the bread that you've been given, the bread of affliction, the bread of sorrows, because of the consequences of your own choices, as well as God causing some kind of learning experience for you to go through, how hard it is to accept when God chastises his people and wants you to accept being chastised. Because whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. 
And if you're not going through trials and tribulations, if you're not going through challenges, I will warn you right now, you might not be a Christian. Straight up. Mano y mano, eye to eye. Person to person. If you haven't gone through trials since you've been saved, and you've been saved for a couple of years, <laughs> let me add that little you know, preface part. If you've been saved for a few years and you haven't gone through any trials, I don't think you're saved. Period. I think you're just kind of shining on and been shined on what's going on. Because God said it and God will do it. And when He says it, He does it. And He has fulfilled the entire Word of God in cycles and in, you know, typologies in my life. Man, I've gone through a David cycle. You know, I've gone through a Samson cycle. I've gone through uh, Paul cycle. I've gone through Peter cycles. I've gone through all kinds of these things in ways of God identifying that type of personality or person or experience in my life that I lived through at the time that I was studying or going through it or brought to it by God himself teaching me. And I've seen too many people around for a long time really not pay much attention to what's going on. And that's kind of what we need to do because if you think that it's always going to be sunshine and lollipops and rainbows you know and putting smiley faces on every experience you go through you don't have the right perspective of the love of God in your life the love of God says that he's not going to leave you the way you are he's going to change you he's going to bring you really to your knees at some point in time where you will cry out to him and discover he is love but you'll discover it through that comfort that you'll need at the time. Not through just smiling every day and going along your way and thinking everything's hunky-dory and fine. Because you live in a land that we are accountable for all this prosperity we've been given. We are responsible for the grace that God has shed upon us. We are his example of a Christian nation to the world. And we are a Christian nation. Don't let anyone ever lie to you or try to make up some kind of weird advertising scheme to tell you, oh, we're not a Christian nation. We don't have a Christian president. Yeah, you do. He goes to church. Pardon me, but that's about what the summation of a Christian is nowadays. They go to church. Okay. You know, God decides the rest. But the point is this. Irregardless of the president or the government or the Congress or your circumstances, it's still a Christian nation. This nation has provided more to the world in reaching out with the gospel and the message of Jesus Christ than any other nation in the history of the world. We are it. We are the last. You could call us the last bastion of faith because in some ways you can see the benefit and the detriment of being that last nation on earth that's preaching the gospel on a regular basis. We are the Gentile nation that God has chosen to use as a demonstration of His mercy and grace, even as He chose the children of Israel to demonstrate His law and His justice and to provide for a way of salvation through the nation of Israel and shall yet bring salvation to them in the end of the tribulation, great tribulation period, when all Israel will be saved. In the meantime, yeah, if anyone dies, in America or in Israel, they go to hell. They don't know Jesus. They don't have the Son of God in them. They go to hell. Point blank. So really, when you wake up in the morning, think about that. Where are you? Are you appreciative of living in this land that God has given, that God has shed His grace upon? Are you thanking God for your president, your Congress, and your local representatives, as well as your police force? as well as the fire department and everyone else around you that helps provide for your wealthy living. Because you are what the children of Israel were warned about. Living in the land that God causes you to prosper in and living in paneled houses and cities without walls. And that's what you're in, really. You are the fulfillment of what God had promised to the children of Israel as they went into the land and failed miserably. Will you rise to the occasion? 
and give thanks? Or will you be like that wealthy church that Jesus warned about in the book of Revelation, that you've left your first love and that you're no longer even aware that God is there and that He's standing at the door and knocking at your heart to try to get back in, to warn you of the things that you've gotten yourself involved in. Where are you at and who are you listening to today? Prosperity or the promise that God has said, blessed is he who overcomes because I will make him to sit down at a table fit for a banquet for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to which you are invited to go. I would rather suffer the ignominious reputation of being a failure in this life but a success in God's eyes than to live a prosperous life in America and find myself a failure before the Lord our God when it comes to that day and he makes up his jewels in the crown of his own glory and he decides to say to you blessed are you blessed are you blessed are you or I pray he does not say to you depart from me I never knew you today Seek to know the Lord in a more intimate and personal way than you ever have before. But thank Him also for where you are today. Whether it be in the hospital, whether it be in the mountaintops, whether it be in prosperity or poverty, whether it be in riches or rags, whether it be in employment or unemployed, whether you be wherever you are, remember to give thanks unto the Lord our God. Because that was one of the reasons God took the children of Israel out of the land. Not because he was sparing them from what was going to happen in the land, but because they were not thankful, neither were they glad. Be thankful today that the Lord your God has caused grace to shine upon not just this land, but upon you. Because God shed his grace on America, but he also shed it on you.